Okay, I think we're live, everybody. Uh, and, and for those who are watching, uh, this is David Wildstein. I'm the editor of the New Jersey Globe. Uh, I am joined by Micah Rasmussen, the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics at Ryder University, and Joey Fox, reporter for the New Jersey Globe, who has been laser focused on maps and redistricting for uh, uh, four months now. We're going to talk about the final legislative map that was adopted uh, by the commission last week, uh, and we'll walk through we'll walk through the process and, and a bunch of the districts. And, and you know, I'll start, Micah, with you. It it, it seemed it seemed to me that there was a, a totally different environment going on with legislative rather than than congressional. Well, you know, there's a couple there's a couple of things there that I would note. One is this has almost become a cliche, but the national polarization makes it such that you just can't agree on anything between Republicans and Democrats. The stakes are so high for each one of those congressional seats nationally. I really think that had a lot to do with the Republican lawsuit on the congressional map. They just had to uh, show the national party that they were fighting for everything. Um, you know, here you had both sides very engaged and very much advocating for their positions, but they were able to broker a deal between themselves. I just don't think that that could have happened with the national map at this moment. And I think, uh, and, and, and you both know, I, I guess the whole world knows at this point that, that I don't think that, that former Justice John Wallace did a very good job on congressional. Uh, I have a different view on Judge Karchman. He, he seemed to be engaged. He seemed to know his role there. Uh, he didn't want to cast the deciding vote between two maps. He wanted a consensus. Uh, I think Philip Karchman did a, a, an outstanding job there. I, 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 go ahead, Joey. Go ahead. My take is that it was, it was almost a flawless process from start to finish in that, you know, there was transparency at every level. There was, um, you know, you had those initial release of the partisan maps. Um, that it got a little bit murky towards the end when everything was just being hashed out in a hotel room. Um, but, you know, it's still, that is to a certain extent, par for the course. But that being said, flawless process, in my opinion, a flawed map, um, flawed in some, in some pretty specific ways that I'll, I'll get into over the course of this. Right. Um, and so like the, the, the really great things that happened during this process shouldn't necessarily obscure the fact that the, map, the end map, like any map, as Judge Karchman said when he, when he voted for it, is flawed. It's not perfect. Um, but yeah, overall, this was um, definitely something that future redistricting commissions in New Jersey will, I imagine, look to as like, a, oh, wow, we could maybe even do that. And yeah, and, you know, go ahead, it's Mike. interesting, David, you, 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 uh, you laughed at the, um, the masking of the, Demo the initial Democratic and Republican maps by calling them uh, Parkway and Turnpike. And, uh, you know, it was a little bit of a, you know, a gimmick, but it was a fun one. Um, I knew going into the last chapter of the process that Karchman would try to uh, avoid the, 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 the idea that, that it was going to be the Democratic or the Republican map. Of course, we didn't know how he would do that or how he would bring that off, but you, know, you could tell that he was gonna avoid the idea that there was going to be uh, the Republican map one or the Democratic map one. And I guess if you judge these things by the crude term, uh, standard of neither side getting everything that they want, but both sides getting some of what they want, this was a successful outcome. I agree. And I, I think you look at the two chairs, uh, the co-chairs, Democrat Leroy Jones and, and Republican Al Barless, uh, they both get to go home with, with their head held, heads held high and with talking points of, of, of uh, uh, having put their party on the right course. Jones, Jones had to protect his majorities, and I think he projects, protects them uh, Barless has to say there is there is a possibility of some gains and there is a pathway to a majority that that a lot would have to happen uh, for that majority to uh, to be achieved by the Republicans. It would and, we, and we'll talk more about it later. But I think they both come in and out of this uh, really as winners. And I think there's a bunch of legislators who come out as winners and there's there's those who, who clearly come out as losers, and it's not just the obvious ones of, of four senators in two districts, uh, uh, and that is 
That's completely different. I mean, and we've never had this long a runway before of two incumbents having to go at each other in either a primary or in a general as we do this time. That's going to change the dynamics of the legislative caucuses at this point also. And we, we can talk more about that. Uh, but but I, th I think we should just do what people want us to do, which is we'll go through the map. Uh, we'll go north to south. We won't we won't spend a whole lot of time on the uh, on the districts that are that are not really competitive. Uh, but I want to look at some of the ones that are uh, that have had some changes to them. And and you know, as always, we start in number one. And by the way, I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll try to say not say this as many times. You know, I didn't. I don't have a horse in this game other than the fact that I I advocated for a renumbering of the maps. <laughs> Uh, and, and it is, you know, I, I guess you could argue maybe that I'm the loser here. I'm the, uh, I'm the one who did not get his, you know, anything that I asked for. They did it uh, in one tiny place. They renumbered 32 and 33 to be more logical. Right. And we're going to talk about that point. because yeah. I think they did that wrong. They, you have district 31 and then 33 and then 32. So the, the one place where they renumbered, I think they, I think they messed up a little bit. No, no, no. no they, they renumbered it, I think, into the proper order. I think they well, renumbered it into the, well, we'll get, we'll see when we'll we get, get there. there. Let's get, let's but, get there. So let's start in district Let's start in District Two because I think I think we 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 very much discussed this the last time. Uh, this is a compact district. Uh, Joey and I disagree on this district. Uh, uh, that doesn't that doesn't make uh, Joey right or wrong. It just means means we're looking at the data differently. But Micah, you are you are a South Jersey guy, so maybe you'll 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 break a tie here. But they have they have added Galloway that had been with Ocean County for the last 10 years. And it, it lost uh, Buna and Buna Vista and, and well, Folsom. And uh, Harbor City and Mullica. Mullica is a decent sized one too. It yeah. is, it is. And, and so I think, I think two is gonna be exactly as it's been since 1973, which is that uh, another decade, another uh, uh, era of competitive election districts in district two. Yeah, I, I think that that's right. I think the town, the, the way that the towns shake out, and this is always a funny business, but I spent a lot of time looking at the legislative races and you can't just compare apples to oranges because it's different candidates that'll be running in different races, of course. But if you try to just move the towns into the new districts, you wind up in 2021 with about 400 more Republican votes and uh, in, in 2019 with about 600 more Republican votes. You know, we want to look at those odd number years, but those odd number years behave differently. And so either way, it's just a smidge less competitive, not a lot, but a smidge less competitive. About a half a point. Uh, about a yeah, half a right. point. That's right. Yep. Yep. Joey, I mean, you but, think, go ahead. Well, so if, if you look at races that were contested across um, Atlantic County, like the governor's race, for example, adding Galloway and substituting it for those Republican inland towns <laughs> like, like Buna and Mullica is a benefit for Democrats. It, it, it gives them half a point or a point more in margin. Um, and that is true across, because David, I know you were challenging me to look at um, yeah. local races like county clerk race. That's true in county clerk races too. Um, in, in 2021, Galloway voted in the county clerk race, for example, voted about in line with the county overall um, in that race, which was Republican plus 12, something like that. Um, the, t the towns that got removed from this district voted more Republican than that. Um, okay. So it, 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 you're right, Micah, that it can be tough to compare when you've got a completely uncompetitive Ocean County district. Those right. Democrats who are running in that seat are not going to be yeah. all that strong, most likely. Um, I think now that you've seen Galloway added to the district and Democrats are going to campaign like hell there, just like they're campaigning like hell in the rest of the district, it's going to be a little bit of a boost for Democrats. That's my take. So we're going to have Senator Palestine and Assemblyman Guardian and Assemblywoman Swift are, are, are just going to have to keep working in this district. Uh, I don't think they're ever going to see safe seats. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I think, I think not since Bill Gormley have we really seen safe seats here. Uh, but that plays into districts one and, and three and four and sort of a shuffle that, that they did there. Uh, you know, one of the things in district one that I just, I just had a hard time as I was running these numbers, uh, is that, is that I keep forgetting that Jeff Andrews in these numbers. So, I'm almost at a point where I'm throwing out past legislative history in District One yeah. because because Jeff Andrew was an anomaly as a Democrat 
uh, a conservative Democrat running there. I think all these numbers have been thrown out. I think, I think at the end of the day, Testa and, and McClellan and Simonson are, are in good shape. But the interesting thing is, is they pick up Bridgeton. And Bridgeton was a town that Steve Sweeney uh, won by almost 800 votes, 71% yep. of the vote. And that is shifting into District 1. Uh, uh, if you see a point where, where Testa is, is facing a tough race, uh, he's going to win it or lose it based upon Bridgeton you know, and, and being able to keep Bridgeton and Vineland and Millville. And Millville is a town where it's a nonpartisan November town. Testa played there last November and his slate won. So as Democratic as Millville is, Michael Testa's, Michael Testa's allies are running that town. You guys agree, number one, like likely Republican? Yeah, I think it's still likely Republican, especially for the foreseeable future. But you're right. Not only um, do you swap in the Democratic town of Bridgeton, but you also swap out some Republicans surrounding rural townships, which are not doing well for Democrats right now. Hopewell, Shiloh, Stoke, Stoke Creek right. um, and, and Greenwich. Um, so it's you're definitely picking up, uh, you're making it about 1,000 or 1,200 votes closer for Democrats. But right now, you know, Testa can afford those margins, right? So, but if, you know, if it gets closer, and remember, we have had competitive races in the first district. We are going back to Van Drew times, but we have had races within that 1,000 mm -hmm. vote margin before. So it could get tight again. What I think is fascinating about this change is if you showed this, this map to someone in 2018, they would think that this was a Democratic choice to give Bridgeton right. to the first Good district point. and and boost the local Democratic incumbents a little bit and figure, oh, Steve Sweeney is going to be fine in the third, no matter what. So he can afford to lose Bridgeton. Now, with the context we have from 2021, we look at this and think, oh, this is probably a Republican choice. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to drown out Bridgeton into the first district where Michael Testa has seemingly a pretty strong hold over things and make the third district a little bit safer for Ed Durr, Beth Sawyer, Beth Ann McCarthy Patrick, who it's less clear yet just how strong of incumbents they are. Right. Um, we talk about them being incumbents, but they they just got there. They're there five weeks. They just got there. They probably still don't have very high. Ed Durr, maybe from his national like coverage, maybe has high name recognition, but they won with most people in the district probably yeah. not having heard of them, yeah. frankly. Um, so, so they have replaced they've 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 dropped Bridgeton and they've picked up some Western Cumberland. Uh, uh, I can see Delaware from my house kind of towns. Yep. Uh, and they've picked up uh, a, a little bit more in in Gloucester. Yep. Uh, uh, Micah, does this, if Steve Sweeney wants to reclaim his seat, if he were to say, I want to go back to the Senate in 2023, does this map make him think maybe I don't, maybe I don't want to take that chance of losing it twice? In a year like 2021, yes, uh, it would make it a lot more Republican. In an off off year like 2019, not necessarily a huge difference, but it is still some. I mean, it, it continues that trend away from Sweeney that we saw in that 2021 race. So it, it you know, it, it moves it further into the, the Durr column. They did what they could um, to, um, um, you know, adjust the district in his favor. So um, I would say, you know, does this weigh on a decision that he might be making? I mean, I don't think he was seriously competitive considering getting in the race in two years, but I think it, it certainly has to be a consideration that the district is now harder than it was. Or well, John Bersicelli. It, it does keep Paulsboro for John Bersicelli and it does, it does. keep Stepford for Steve Sweeney, which was not the original Republican proposal. Both right. of those were out in the original Pro Republican proposal. So there is right. still Democrats or, or someone on the commission. I don't even know who exactly, but someone on the commission is trying to make it still viable. Yeah. And I think it is. I think it's a competitive district. And, and I, you know, I, I wonder if, if John Bersicelli is uh, I mean this, this will clearly affect how he how he thinks, but Republicans, uh, Al Barless and the other Republicans on the commission, and we have to we have to you know look at the fact that that one of the commissioners was Linda Du Bois, the former Salem County Republican chair. Uh, she, after twenty years, finally got some seats back, and and I don't think she was voting for him, Matt. That that didn't uh, didn't give Ed Durr and. Uh, and Beth Ann uh, McCarthy, Patrick, and Beth Sawyer, a, uh, uh, a at least a running start to keep the seats. Well, this is this is one of those things that Joey talked about in the last the last uh, map show that we did. Um, this is a landlocked district, right? And so, 
um, there is a limit to how much you can do, right? There's also a limit because it had to grow because there's been sort of a depopulation going on in the rural, most rural parts of the state. It had to grow. So there was a limit as to how much they could adjust it. They adjusted it as much as they could. And I think what you've heard South Jersey Democrats argue is that they think that a lot of 2021 had to do with the impact of the governor's race. I think if that's true, or if they believe that that's true, then they may think that they can get a cleaner shot in two years without the governor's race at the top of the ticket. Yeah. And look, I mean, the 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 gorilla in the room, and I, I use gorilla because elephant in the room, I don't want it to be a, a, a partisan <laughs> thing. But the gorilla in the room here is, is we don't know what 23 is going to look like. And Republicans, at least to me, appear to be uh, they, they appear to be taking it one cycle at a time, and they're thinking that if 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 there is Phil Murphy fatigue in New Jersey, uh, and if Murphy's numbers in the sixth year of his governorship, his second midterm are down, and historically that is the case, that a governor by their sixth year, not just Chris Christie but others, uh, have seen a little bit of a dip on their approvals. And if Joe Biden hasn't picked up the pieces of his administration and put it everything together, 23 could be a, a decent year for Republicans in some of these swing districts. And I think if that happens, and Joey, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll let you jump in, but I think if that happens, you will see the Democratic A team not opting to run. And then that'll magnify the effect of having these districts be more competitive, not less. Yeah. But when, then with the flip side being when you take things one cycle at a time, you're potentially leaving blind spots in 25, 27, 29. Yeah. So we'll have to see, especially when we get to North Jersey, you know, whether some of those districts that, that are drawn on this map, um, how stable they'll be for Republicans in a good Democratic year. Um, like our immediate thinking is how things are going to look in a good Republican year, because that's what we're most accustomed to just from last year. Uh, right. No guarantee that'll be the case all, was it five races that are going to happen on this map? Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I want to watch my language, even though we're just streaming it. But, the, you know, Republicans, I mean, and I heard this constantly over the last month or so, which is they're, they're, this is this is the effort map. This is the map where we're tired of being in the minority perpetually for 20 years. And we're going to take we're going to take some chances. And, and, and when you see Mike Testo or some others uh, taking a tiny bit of a haircut, uh, it might be, in their view, I think, for the greater good. And, and one of the places where, where I think they can pick up is in the fourth. Yeah. Uh, I think that fourth district has, has changed just enough. And, and by the way, fascinating to me, the fourth district is exactly what was submitted by the Republicans on a map that we, we said a couple of weeks ago, this is not going to be the map. Uh, that was true everywhere but District 4. Republicans got exactly the map that they wanted. Uh, and, and, I, and I have to say there, you, 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 you know, we've, we've said a lot of kind things about the Democratic delegation. Uh, this is inexcusable. Um, you've got a district that right now is represented by three Democrats, albeit three uh, uh, South Jersey Democrats, You've got a Latina Democrat, the, the first Latina elected outside of the city in, in, in New Jersey, um, and they've left them completely exposed. They made no attempt to even alter this proposal a little bit. Um, and uh, that's, you know, really malpractice. By the way, see, I would agree with you, Mikey, except for one thing. Uh, I, think, I think it is all on how you define the Democratic Party. And for the last few years, there's sort of been two of them in this state. And if, if Democrats can keep the majority without, and I'm talking about the Democrats that are in control now, that, are, yeah. that, that yeah. were in control of that commission and the, the, the dumping of Steve Sweeney yeah. uh, was clearly a huge event because had Sweeney not been dumped, had Steve Sweeney been in the room, uh, by sheer force of personality, uh, these maps in the South would all be a little bit different. He was he was never going to vote for for a map that Demo that that five four Democrats voted for last Friday. Uh, so I'm not so sure that I, that they I, don't know what they're doing there. I think they I, might know exactly what they're doing. Well, I think that that's their strategy clearly. But the idea 
of at the same time, you're going to have more competitive maps and more competitive races of seeding a region of the state where there have been a lot of Democratic legislators is playing with fire. It's yeah. it's it's really a dangerous strategy. And by the way, very dangerous if if uh, if lightning struck and some of these competitive some of these districts that are not really competitive, but could be in a wave uh, uh, ever came to fruition. And it took Republicans to to 20 shared control or 21 to a majority. Then, you know, th then we come back and we replay this tape. And, and, you know, Mike, I think I think you'd be right. But but I look at four two, and I said this a couple of weeks ago and, and I I continue to believe that there's uh, there's a former Republican a state senator from this district named George Geist, who has been uh, out of office for a little more than 18 years. He's been a judge. He, he lost this seat by 63 votes to Fred Madden in 2003, despite George Norcross and the South Jersey Democrats spending about, about $5 million. It was for a while the record uh, spending race in the legislature. Uh, this district's gotten more Republican. Um, Geist may not be as well uh, known as he was when he won this seat for the first time in 91, but, but he's, he's 66, he's been on the bench, and he, he hasn't lost the skill sets that got him to the legislature in a Democratic district in the first place. He is I think, a very aggressive. He is a very aggressive. He was a very aggressive legislator. Yeah. He, he, he worked author of Oprah, very, by the way, the friend, friend to all reporters. He was the he was the author of the Open Public Records Act. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd like to get his teeth into some revisions of that at, <laughs> at some point. But but yeah, I but David, before we move on from the fourth, I have to say uh, uh, in this revised district, uh, it looks like the Democrat, it's the one pure flip on the map that I can see that, you know, oh. would automatically go the other way uh, for 2021 with the impact of the governor's race. In 2019, uh, the Democrats can hold on. So, right, um, right. Wait, my calculations and, in this district found Democrats just barely holding on in even 2021. Even Did 2021? Yeah. Yeah, by like a point. Yeah. Um, but and I, I might have. And I, I see, I'm showing uh, Jack Chitterelli won 52.4% of the vote. In in this district, in 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 the new district in 2021, Kim Guadano was at about 48 uh, percent, and and Gloucester is changing. But let me let me just address before we we start to move our way north. But let me address one one other thing that could be a, a game changer here. Depending, and this this map is very much about candidate recruitment, and and one of the things that we have never seen before in New Jersey. We see it with congressional all the time, but because of the, the one year before you take office uh, residency requirement, there's an opportunity for both parties to shop for candidates. There's an opportunity for somebody to go district shopping and look for a place and say, if I relocate to Washington Township in Gloucester County, uh, I can, I can serve in the legislature, and it might be the you know the looking the the looking for a you know a, a Mikey Sherrill kind of a candidate, just somebody completely from the outside with a great resume that could could take advantage and 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 come in. So uh, the other thing that I think is important to point out in this district is the possibility, and again, this would this would be true with Senator slash Judge Geist. It would be. Uh, true with anybody out of Gloucester Township, which is in Camden County. Mm -hmm. And and that is the possibility that a Republican from Camden County could have courtesy. And that, too, is if it ever happened, is a game changer. And you start looking at you start looking at South Jersey, at Burlington and Ocean Atlantic and Cape May, Cumberland, Salem, Gloucester with Ed Durr, you add uh, you had a Republican senator from the Camden portion into the fourth. And that is that is one heck of a of a red wall of senatorial courtesy on getting appointments through anybody. Anybody who'd want to be a judge in, in, in South Jersey would have to go through uh, Republican senators. So I think that would make and that, by the way, that's one of the reasons that George Norcross invent, invested so much money to get rid of George Geist in the first place is is. John Matthewson was from Gloucester. Uh, Geis was from Camden, and and he could not afford to have that Camden senator sitting there with courtesy. So yeah, and the you know, difference I think, 
difference between then and now is is uh, is the impact of Philadelphia TV, and Norcross mm -hmm. was the absolute master of that strategy. Um, we should point out before we move on that the the the, the one-two punch of the changes in this district are that the, the district loses a very democratic town in Lindenwald um, and gains a number of Republican towns, the Bunas, uh, Franklin Town. Water, Waterford, Waterford's a big town yeah, there. Exactly, yep. So one interesting thing about this that like just is part of the reason for why this changed, I think beyond anything to do with partisanship is that both parties seemingly agreed that the fifth district, which is on the current map, very narrowly majority white, um, should become majority minority. Um, so that's something that both original proposals did is this one and the Republican original proposal included Pensacken, the Democratic original proposal shifted the fifth to include Lindenwald. Um, so that seemed to always be built in that the fifth district, which is already represented by two out of three um, legislators of color, but uh, that the fifth district would become one of the state's new um, majority minority districts. And yeah. so because of the shifting that happened from that, you know, you've got the fifth gaining Minsakin, so then the sixth has to shift down, which takes some democratic areas from the fourth, you know, it's kind of the juggling of that. I'm, this, this is obviously a partisan choice in favor of Republicans. This is something that Republicans wanted in the fourth district, yeah. but there's also a reason for this beyond just partisanship. It also has to do with making the fifth majority minority. It's a good point. It's a good point. So, so we spent the last time the three of us were together to, going through maps, we spent a lot of time on seven and eight. I don't think we have to. Uh, I think that is, uh, uh, I think that has had a, a significant change from, from where those, those, uh, 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 you know, the, the theater of the first round of maps, uh, Eight is no uh, longer the ugliest district in the state. So, it is so not. congratulations to it. It is not. And, 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 you know, seven is still solidly democratic. Uh, uh, they didn't, they didn't put Gene Stanfield and Troy Singleton into the same district. Seven uh, stays the same. The yeah. Seven, the same. seven stays the same. And, and Burlington uh, in the eighth, they picked up some of the Burlington towns that were in the ocean County district, Bass river, Washington, uh, it picked up Mullica, Egg Harbor. It keeps Hamilton uh, yeah. and adds Folsom. Uh, uh, you know, from from the numbers that I was looking at, uh, the Republican gubernatorial percentage went up, uh, and the legend about about two and a half, three points. Uh, I think yeah. I think Stanfield and Umba and and Teresi are are in strong shape. I don't I don't. I don't think this is this is going to be the take back of South Jersey uh, uh, seat again. Uh, I don't think there's any disagreement from either of you. Uh, you know, and this then, is something that Democrats might compete for again in 25, 27, yes, et cetera. Yeah. But like in the immediate short term, I don't see any reason to think that this will be all that much more competitive than it already was. Right. And it, it means long, you know, long term. Yeah, yeah. Long term, they're going to have to watch their their flank and they're going to have to. They're going to have to make sure that Evesham, Evesham doesn't consider to continue to have these gains. They want to they want to watch out for 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 some of these other towns. Uh, the Ocean County districts, I mean, they are they are solid again. Uh, you know, we haven't had a a Democratic legislator from Ocean since John Russo and and right. John Paul Doyle, uh, and 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 there's no sign of any Democrats representing Ocean County. Any, yep. any time in the near future and they, they get even more Republican. Yeah. Yeah. More. Yeah. So, so let's, let's go up and let's go, let's go West to East. So, so uh, uh, 15 again, solidly, still solidly democratic, but is, is creeping into Hunterdon County. Yeah. yeah. It just drowns out a few more Republican towns than it did last time. Yeah. But, but it's not going to make a difference. Uh, 14, uh, uh, Senator Linda Greenstein can can sleep well. She is not going to have a primary with another senator. I'm not so sure that she would have anyway. I think I think she has proven herself uh, uh, for, for for the last 22 years. 20 it'll be 23 years of of just winning tough race after tough race. Uh, tenacious legislators in, in the entire yeah. state, and and. Um, and 14 loses Spotswood, which is a Republican, tiny Republican town, but it's a Republican town. So they pick up, Democrats pick up, you know, a couple hundred more votes there. Yeah. So so I look at 14 and I'm thinking this is a, a likely Democratic district. But and, you know, and, and if 
if Senator Greenstein is watching and, and she's feeling just a little too comfortable with the, the platitudes that she just received, uh, if there's a wave, if it is a staunch Republican wave somewhere, uh, 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 a Repu Republicans could really, they were, their only path to a 21 seat majority is by winning the 14. And, and that would mean that would mean, you know, flipping Hamilton and flipping Monroe. Unlikely, yeah. but but uh, uh, Senator Greenstein does not have the job security that say Senator Ruiz has. I think I think she and and uh, the assembly members know that Hamilton is a historic swing, um, and uh, you know may not be behaving like that right now, but historically it can very much go either way. Um, you could say the same for Monroe in the right conditions, or even Robbinsville. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's look at the 11th. Uh, I, I think that will be I don't think anybody's going to disagree that that will continue to be a competitive district uh, for the next eight years, for the remainder of the decade. Uh, Senator Vin Gopal uh, has proven that he's a, uh, a tenacious campaigner, a extraordinary fundraiser. But he's got he is the only senator with two assembly members. Uh, uh, that are occupying the same seat and uh, the same district. And he's going to be looking, uh, going to have to look over his shoulders until he gets to that, that next, next four year term. And I, and I, and I should point out, uh, 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 I'm, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to tip any, any hands scales here, but when I listen to, to Vin Gopal and Senator Declan O'Scanlan uh, uh, guest host for me on the radio last weekend, uh, uh, I think I have a swing seat too, because those two are really pretty good. So, uh, <laughs> but he um, he's a tenacious uh, redistrictor too, to the extent that he um, you know to the extent that he prevailed upon um, his um, delegation. Uh, you know, he got what he could, which is that the district um, you know adds a couple hundred more Democratic votes or loses that many Republican votes, and so it adds to his margin. Um, which in the end was about 2,700 votes last time, you know, he may, maybe gets another 10% on top of that. So it, it makes it yeah. harder for Republicans who thought that they were going to peel off and take away from him and make the district closer. They had aspirations of that. That didn't come to pass for them. And Joey, you, you wrote a story uh, last week that based upon this new district, based on the parameters of this new district, uh, uh, Joanne Downey, might still be in the state assembly. Yeah, I mean, pretty but, much th this. So this this proposal was exactly what the Democratic proposal was um, originally. So this is kind of the counterpoint of the fourth, where it's something where the commission just took exactly what Democrats wanted. Um, and you can tell that from the partisanship, because like the district gets a little bit more strangely shaped, but it loses one Republican town, West Long Branch, and gains two pretty competitive towns, Fairhaven and uh, Bradley. Bradley Beach is what it is. Yeah. Um, and you know the the 2021 state assembly election in this district was the closest in the state. It was ridiculously close. You know we were still looking at who was going to win a week and a half, two weeks out, something like that. Um, and yeah, it, you know the the few hundred votes that Democrats gain under this map, that's all you need. That's all you needed in 2021. Right. I mean, Joanne Downey and Eric um, Hodling lost by a few hundred votes. Yep. So um, you're really like you're not going to have an exact repeat of 2021 in 23 or any future year. So who knows exactly what will happen. Um, but if you're looking at an incredibly tight election again, this map is only helpful to Democrats. You and we've talked about the, the uh, where Republicans can make gains. Uh, there is, there is no district that will be higher on Craig Coughlin's target list to pick up assembly seats mm -hmm. than the 11th. Uh, yeah. He's, he's going to be looking at Marilyn Caperno and Kim Uhlner and saying, you know, there are there are no Democrats on this map in greater jeopardy of losing uh, 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 their seats to a Republican than these two. So this is going to be this is going to be an expensive campaign, but it's uh, and it's going to be a great race. You could you could see um, Monmouth Republicans being disappointed. You know, we know that uh, Republicans can't get everything that they're looking for in a map, and Democrats can't get everything they're looking for in a map. And you know, by 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 pulling one lever, you're going to you know lose out on the rest of the district. You're on the, on the on the corresponding side of the district. So there's that. But I think there were some some local Republicans in Monmouth who would have liked to have 
um, you know, taken the shot at this race. It doesn't mean they're out of it by any means, but I think they were looking for an improvement in the district that they did not get. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think uh, uh, this is this is, again, the the influence of Judge Karchman, uh, who was not looking for gerrymandering. He 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 was he was transparent and he said, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to have a certain number of competitive races in New Jersey. Uh, and and I, I've got to think that the 11th was one of the ones that he had in mind. Uh, but we go up, we go up and, and by the way, well, you know, another one that we spent a lot of time talking about last time, not necessary, at least I don't think so anymore, is Sam Thompson, who will be 88 in 2003, uh, uh, has, you know, has a uh, has a path to remaining in the state Senate until he's 96, if he wants to. Thank you. And he won't have to go as deep into North, into Burlington County to do it, right? No. He's only got no. one town left, North Hanover. Yeah, you know, I mean, this district and, remains bizarre, but it's bizarre in a way that allows all three incumbents to stay there. So, right, right. And I think, you know, I mean, this is, uh, uh, you know, some someday we should all invite Senator Thompson on, you know, and, and, and tell us about his 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 secret of life, because, uh, uh, you know, I, I heard that he was out. He was out shoveling snow when when senators uh, uh, 40 years younger were hiring other people to do it. So. Uh, you know, I think I think he's in good shape there. Certainly politically, uh, he's in great shape. And, you know, 19 uh, remains, um, you know, identical to as it's been since right. uh, since since 1991, uh, almost identical to how it's been for the last for the last 50 years. Uh, that's not going to change. 18 is not going to change. Uh, 17. I mean, all these all these weird things that we saw in the initial yeah. submissions that were were meant to get people uh, talking about uh, a possibility of a deal map that worked because it's uh, Middlesex went back to the way it, it usually is. Yeah, well, Republicans annihilated Middlesex on their original map, and this yes. says no, you don't stop that. And, and once that didn't happen, then you fell back to the default position, the default map. Yeah, exactly, and exactly, yeah. and and it looks you know those are. Those seats are are not going to flip, uh, and uh, uh, in the seventeenth, I mean the seventeenth, Jim Florio couldn't even tip over that district. So, <laughs> so that that continues to be where it is. And then you then you come to the sixteenth district, and and I think that's uh, Joey. I know you look closely at sixteen. This this is still a competitive district. They they move the needle. Uh, a little bit away from Democrats uh, by taking uh, by by taking out they took out uh, uh, Somerville. Uh, they also took out Manville, uh, which was a Republican leaning town, and where uh, where Joe Lucas, IBEW member who had run a competitive race last time, uh, no longer in that district. Uh, but they picked up more of Hunterdon County. Yep. And Joey, you, t- tell me what you think about this district. I mean, so yeah, so it shifts like, I don't know, a point towards Republicans, maybe. Um, I'm of the opinion, and I imagine people would disagree with me, but I'm of the opinion that Democrats don't really need that extra point at this point. Um, oh, oh, double point. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, you've got now this trio of Democratic incumbents, all of whom seem pretty strong, and who are all able to win by like modestly healthy margins in a bizarrely bad year for Democrats. Like 2021 took Democrats by surprise in how weirdly bad it was. And they still won all of the 16th district seats by, you know, relatively healthy margins, like not recount level. Mm -hmm. And so now that you've got those three incumbents in there, there definitely could be a worse cycle even in 2021. So I'm not ruling that out. I'm not saying this district is completely uncompetitive, but it is the kind of thing where Democrats have their foot severely lodged in the door here. And I'm not really convinced that this map, the tiny shifts that it makes would be enough to, to help Republicans sort of dislodge that. I agree with you. I have, I've written on my notes, insignificant, uh, because um, they, they, do, they do pick up some votes, but it would not have changed any outcome in 2021. It would, it would have made even less of a difference in 2019. And so I think they can withstand, the Democrats can withstand these changes um, as we see them drawn and uh, still compete as strongly as they're competing now. 
But interestingly, I bet, I, I, I'm presuming you didn't calculate 2015 assembly results. I'll bet Andrew Zucker would actually not have won this district to begin with which sort of kicked right. off the democratic revitalization yeah. here. That's, but that's, that's so far in the past at this there. point, yeah. and it's yeah. completely yeah. hypothetical, so. I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think this is, I think this is a district, it's, it's not as competitive, uh, uh, nowhere near as competitive for Republicans as four and 11 will be. Uh, but I think it is, I think it's clearly third on their list. If they're gonna really play, uh, they go to 16 before they go to, uh, 14 and 38. Yep. And, and I think, I think that's where it is. And, and when I look at 23, now 23 is a district we spent absolutely no time on last, uh, last time we all, we all got together. Uh, and this district, uh, which is, is really oddly shaped. It almost looks like a tomahawk to me. Uh, uh, and, 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 um, um, uh, but one of the things, and I think this is significant because we talked about incumbents who are in danger uh, in, in keeping their, their seats in the assembly, look how much of Hunterdon County uh, is, is no longer in that district. Right. Uh, the 15th took a little bit out uh, and, and Somerset grew. And now what you're looking at as a district, and I didn't calculate primary turnout numbers, but but this district's about 40% Warner and 40% Somerset and, and 20% Hunterdon. And the question I have is, is with Assemblyman Eric Peterson and whether, whether Republicans in Warren and Somerset County uh, are gonna be willing to let Hunterdon continue to have that assembly seat. That there's obviously the, the, the undertones of Peterson's running against Kane. Uh, you know, I would would never suggest that some party leader might might suggest to an assembly member that that their career might be on the line if they don't drop out of the race, because, of course, that never happens. But whether Peterson runs for Congress or doesn't run for Congress, uh, I've got to wonder whether Somerset, uh, which which has no Republican legislators. Right. Uh, you know, some, whether whether it is uh, uh, somebody out of Bridgewater or. Uh, Bedminster or or Joe Lukak in Manville, and whether they're going to make a play for that seat in a uh, 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 in the twenty three primary. And and as you say, with Warren taking such a more prominent role in this in the in in the composition of this district, they have um, they have a, a great bench of Republican elected officials, young Republican elected officials who've been in for a little while. They may be looking to make a step up. I don't see why they necessarily, somebody doesn't take that race at some point um, and decide that they're going to go for it too. Warren does right. have two of the three currently though. So, I mean, I'm not, I, I, it would be crazy for a, for a political party in New Jersey to get greedy with what they want to do in a district. Um, no. But Warren does already That never it. happens. You know, you're, you're new, Joey. That that never happens in New Jersey. I know. Right? Everyone in New Jersey ever gets behaves completely above board yeah. and very ethically. No, no. Um, so I'm yeah, just so saying they're taking a, a bigger chunk out of this. They're, they're, they're becoming a bigger part of the district. So. Yeah, they no, are. That is true. Yeah. They are. And the other thing that is, is worth noting, I think, is that uh, uh, we, talked, we talked about senatorial courtesy in South Jersey. Uh, but but uh, if there's a Democratic governor and you are a Democrat uh, in Hunterdon, uh, it's a little bit easier. Than it used to be, you know, back in the days when when Leonard Lance was was the senator, or or when when Bill Schluter, Dick Zimmer, and they had all of Hunterdon County. So uh, courtesy becomes murky there too. And and I'll tell you this, and I and I you know I I, I was was speaking with an old friend about this today. If if Eric Peterson were to lose his seat, if Somerset decided they wanted something, this would be the first time in history that Hunterdon County did not have uh, a representative in the legislature. And, and for a county that is that strongly Republican, uh, I think that is, that is significant. So, so the only thing to watch in 23, it's not in a general, uh, but it is, it is the potential for a primary there. Uh, you know, when we go to Union County, uh, I mean, Nick Scatari changed his district just a little bit. He, he, he shed areas that I think you know, not that he's going to lose a general by any means, but 
but places like Middlesex Borough and Dunellen and Greenbrook, uh, if there's any towns that he 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 was going to have some trouble with, uh, you know, it would be down there, and 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 he never has had any trouble down there before. Uh, but that went to John Bramnick, and there was there was a little bit of there was some changes there. Nothing that's going to affect the delegation, uh, but I think they made Bramnick stronger. I think Bramnick getting out of Roselle Park. Uh, is helpful to him. I think getting out of Cranford is helpful to him because that is a town uh, that is that is trending heavily Democratic. And now he's in Bernardsville and Peapack Gladstone, and uh, and he's got he's got Bedminster and, and Bernards Township. I I I don't think that's. I think that is probably a seat that Joey will say twenty seven or twenty nine. Watch out. But but I don't think 23, 25 is going to be there. Yeah, the way I phrased it on Twitter was a ticking time bomb. It's the kind of thing where Republicans will always have to be looking over their back at it. Um, but they've got a strong kind of the inverse of the six of the 16th. They've in 2021, they had the opportunity to shove in a really strong delegation who now can hold it for however long they want. Um, and it's definitely it's going to take a, a various combination of factors to actually dislodge for Democrats to dislodge them. Right. And then, you know, look at Morris County again. I mean, this is. The, the the idea that the 25th was trending toward the the Democrats uh, Republicans knew this uh, they knew that this was going to be a district uh, that that it, it wasn't in play in seven you know it was in play in 17 and 19 and 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 it didn't work out they didn't and it was in play in the 20s special didn't work out for them 21 they they sort of cut bait on it. Now I think it's become a little bit more Republican. Uh, and in 26, we'll, we'll, you know, it's picked up some of the old Cody towns, but I think it has, uh, it has played out okay. And, and the interesting thing about 25 and 26 is they traded incumbents. So Chris Barranco went from freshman assemblyman uh, from Jefferson went from 26 to 25 and, uh, and Brian Bergen went from 25 to 26. I think they'll, they'll both be fine. I, you know, uh, one of the things that it, it, this was I found interesting that a lot of people didn't realize, uh, at least at the start of his career on a statewide level, is Assemblyman Christian Barranco is is Hispanic, and he is the only Hispanic Republican in the legislature. And they were able to make a deal, you know, they were able to, not a deal, but they were able to make a case uh, that by, by combining the Rockaways and Dover and, and you know, part of Madison and, and some of these, some other towns here, uh, Morristown, uh, uh, they increased the number of Hispanics in the 25th district. And, and I think that helped them sell this. But I think I think 25, 26, you know, at least for the next couple of cycles, unless anybody disagrees, I think we're, you know, I think they're going to remain Republican. Yeah, for as much, for as many towns as got swapped in and out of the, both of those districts, uh, electoral -wise, electorally, um, there's really hardly any change. There's the yeah. slight changes in both districts. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I will, I will add is that the 25th, actually, just looking at the numbers that I've got, the 25th weirdly gets slightly less Hispanic, not more Hispanic because of the changes with the 24th. Um, which feels counterintuitive, but the main change is that now you've made it so that it has a Hispanic legislator, which is right. not before. And then you've got, okay. conversely, you put Brian Bergen in a bit of a safer district in the 26th, which might be helpful given that he has more, more so than say, Ora Dunn or Christian Barranco, he has very much cast himself as this kind of conservative stalwart, um, this fighter against liberalism in Trenton. Um, you know, the which people is, with- those, Which is going to play really well in his district. Yeah, exactly. With the people with those strongly partisan identities will always benefit from having a slightly more partisan district, which he now does. Uh -huh. So, so I I, I want to get to to the fun one. In you know, we'll do we'll do District Forty is the penultimate to to Dick Cody and 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 and, and Nia Gill. But uh, when we talk about the, this this district in the Republican uh, head fake scenario of a couple of weeks ago. This district became more competitive. This is the one where we all thought later in the decade, this one 
could actually flip with the right candidates. Uh, that was indeed a head fake. It is, it is no more. This is a, this is a great district for Republicans. And, and this is where I put, uh, this is where I put a, another Republican incumbent in danger of losing their seat in the next election. Uh, and, and I don't know if it's Kevin Rooney or Krista Phillips, but they both live in, uh, I'll just use the big board for a second, but, but they both live in, they both live in Wyckoff and, uh, and uh, which, which is over here. And uh, uh, they, this district lost a bunch of towns right. in Bergen County and Allen it's Hill. picked up, it's picked up a lot in West Essex. It's yep. picked up the yep. Fairfield and the Caldwells and Verona and Essex Fells. Sure. Uh, uh, I am uh, I am calling this Al Barless's commission on the map uh, because he is the Essex County Republican chairman. And I think he's going to pick up a Republican assembly member in that district. I think it's impossible for Bergen to make the case. Quite frankly, Peter Murphy could make the case of Bergen shouldn't get anything. Uh, we're going to keep Christian Corrado and we're going to have an assembly member from Wayne and we'll let our friend Al Barless uh, Al Barlis is going to have the uh, the third seat, uh, but but I think you know if I had to bet my my own money on this, I say that either Rooney or DePhillips is is toast. I think one of them is going to have to go because you know I think Al Barlis has earned his commission on this map. One thing I'll add about this district is that it flips from a Trump district to a Biden district. That uh-huh. doesn't mean all that much in doesn't saleable races yeah. in, in in suburban areas where. Um, you know, where Republicans outrun Biden by a crap ton of votes. But yeah. it is interesting that this this compromise map, actually, if you just look at 2020 presidential, is better for Democrats in that one regard. It is. I, it I, is. See, it slightly, I see it slightly on the state legislative side, too. Nothing that's going to threaten the, the Republican yeah. dominance, but but it, it does get um, a modicum more competitive. Yeah. And Chitter- Jack Chitterelli got 56 percent of the vote in this district. So this is, this is a plus, you know, on, on gubernatorial, it's, it's, it's actually pretty good. Uh, so let's, let's talk about the new 27th. Uh, uh, you have, you have the longest serving legislator in the history of New Jersey, a former governor, Dick Cody, and he has now been placed in a district, uh, with, with a one-time ally, uh, uh, and that's uh, that's Nia Gill, uh, uh, who has been in the Senate for uh, uh, she'll have been in the Senate for 22 years mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the current term and in the legislature, I think, for 28. Uh, Democrats have been in Essex County looking to, to dump her for a little while. They haven't been able to. Uh, uh, I'm going well, to interesting. I'm going to reserve my my option as as the moder here, and I'm I want to go last here. So why don't you guys tell me tell me about it. first of all, not on the table at all, anytime, anywhere, uh, no matter what, for Republicans to win a general here. So so who's going to win this primary? No, it, it and it will adds. it go to a primary? Yeah. Go ahead, Joey. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I I you first. Okay, all right, that's fine. It adds. You you are correct, uh, uh, David. It adds. Uh, better than a thousand votes more toward the democratic column. Um, so, uh, you know, by adding Montclair and Clifton um, and uh, losing um, some of those uh, um, uh, Morris towns and others. Um, but, you know, it's funny that we talk about um, Senator Cody um, retiring uh, in favor, potentially in favor of Senator Gill. Uh, you know, I- I'm gonna commit like the mortal sin here in a couple weeks um, Senator Gill will have her birthday, so happy birthday to her. But she's only a year younger than him, um, so <laughs> so it is amazing that we're talking about um, the idea that he, because he's just been around so much longer, um, and uh, um, you know that 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 he somehow ought to be the guy to retire. And of course, we we've talked before about Assemblyman McKeon, who's just uh, ten years younger than that, and he's sort of the guy lay, laying in wait uh, to um, potentially become the senator in that district. I um, I guess in spite of what I just said, you know, Senator Gill over the weekend told um, the ledger uh, in assessing the new district, these are towns that I've represented 
uh, or represent now or will represent in the future. So that's as close to a declaration as she was gonna get, but I think she signaled her intentions. Yeah, and I mean, she she just ran for, for Senate president, um, you know, last month, got two total votes. Um, one of which was hers. One of which was her own, right. um, which signals, in an uncharitable interpretation, it signals that she has no idea when to quit when she's behind. The charitable interpretation is that this might be a tough campaign for her. She might be running off the line and she will still go at it with all her might. So as she has, as she has, and as Senator Cody has, these are two people who have beaten the line, two of the that, that rarest of breeds in New Jersey. They have both done, you know, the improbable. Yeah. And I, I look at it and, and first of all, I think Cody's going to have the line. I don't, I don't, I don't really, really doubt that at all. He's represented most of this district and in, in, he had Montclair for a long time uh, before, before they split it off 20 years ago. And, uh, and, and Senator Gill, who was, I mean, that was, that was the ticket of, it was Dick Cody in the Senate and Gill and Leroy Jones were the mm-hmm. assembly members in that right. district. And this was one of the- Look new where districts. they are now. Yeah, yeah. And look at, you know, and, and this was one of the districts that, that was created in that, that 2001 uh, redistricting the the Larry Bartles uh, gerrymander and and I think I think what we're we're seeing here is is uh, and and this is the only reason I think that there's there's anybody really still watching it is uh, you are going to have uh, uh, a a cut uh, potentially uh, you have a choice of electing a a black woman or a white man. And I think the party organization's going to go with, with a white man there. I think there's some other interesting things to look at. Uh, Clifton is in that district, uh, which means John Curry is gonna have to make a decision who he gives his line to. Uh, I happen to, I'm, I, you know, I, at this point I put my bet on Dick Cody uh, that he'll get the line in, in Passaic County. And then it becomes, what are they gonna do with assembly seats. So you have you have John McKee and this time he's running with Tom Giblin. Tom Giblin is is an institution. I know Joey and I you talked we, we talked about it last week. Uh, you know there have been retirement rumors about Tom Giblin uh, for years. I've known I've known Tom Giblin. I've known Assemblyman Giblin for for 40 something years. Uh, uh, if you tell him that he has to retire, uh, then he's staying exactly where it is. He is he is not going anywhere until he decides he wants to, uh, and uh, uh, and and I think he is. Uh, I, I think as as one of the statesmen of the Democratic Party, I don't think anybody's going to dispute that. Uh, but I think as you look at future planning, uh, it's going to create a little bit of a conflict in Essex. Uh, Montclair will view that as their assembly seat. And, and they're going to be enormously reluctant uh, to give that up. Uh, but I don't know that Livingston and, and Milburn are necessarily going to feel that way. Uh, and I, I think they may be looking at a, a little bit of a change there. You know, I am, uh, as you both know, from Livingston, uh, the, the Democratic Municipal Chair, Pat Siebold, who uh, 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 was was more than anybody else besides myself re- responsible for me not not holding public office after the age of 27. Uh, and, she, and she and I have become friends over the last few years, but I mean we didn't we didn't get along for for a long time. But she is tough, and she's she's not going to just sit back and say Ah, Livingston doesn't care. We don't want anything. And and Livingston and Milburn have this. Uh, sort of strong alliance too. So the two of those towns are, uh, they have not been represented in the legislature. Livingston, not since Tom Kane Sr., Governor Kane, wow. left the legislature, has, has Livingston had uh, had a representative in the state assembly. Uh, I would not be surprised if they go to look for that. This is just one of those districts, David, though, that no town is going to is going to take a back seat, right? I mean, uh-huh. everybody, it's going to be very participatory. And you know, Nia Gill is going to use, um, you know, is going to, Montclair is going to be a base and, and th- those, you know, the, the, the socialist state of Montclair is going to be a base for her. And um, 
And, you know, she, we said it before about the line, but I mean, she defeated uh, Leroy Jones handily in that race with him having the line. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it was not even close. And so, um, you know, so I, I, she's formidable. Actually, we, I think we, it was sort of close, but was it close? Yeah. 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 So, okay. All right. But, but, but still, and they were, you know, and, and the, the big difference between uh, uh, that district 20 years ago and today is East Orange was splinter. Yeah. There were two factions in East Orange and one was with Jones and the other was with Gill uh, and, uh, and Jones lost a close race, close Democratic primary for mayor in 01 when he left right. the assembly. Right. Uh, I mean, Sheila Oliver had lost a primary for mayor of East Orange by, I think it was a couple dozen votes. Today, East Orange is, is a, a large number, of, a large block of Democrats. Uh, and Leroy Jones is the Democratic municipal chairman. He I think he has a county committee meeting every Saturday morning and he's never taken his eye off that city. And, uh, and they are not having, uh, uh, they're, they're just not, they're, they're not going to be divided anymore. So, so I think that's, that's a big thing. I think Mike, I, I'm trying to read his face. I think he's looking to see if I was right or wrong. On yeah, the I am looking. You're right. You're exactly yeah. right. Yes. But, yeah. but let, pipe in and let us know. But, and then, and then I just want to talk Gil, briefly. Gilby about, Jones. You'll be judged by a thousand votes. Okay, so that's not a yeah. lot. Yeah, that's no, it's not, not a lot. Yeah. So, so the twenty eighth, and I just want to talk about it briefly, uh, because you know, I, I can't. There is nothing that could happen that would cause the twenty eighth district uh, to to ever go Republican. Uh, uh, you have Ron Rice there, but uh, you know, now with Cleopatra Tucker in Newark. And and Myla J.C. from South Orange, and and I just have to point out, uh, uh, my I'm told that that Assemblywoman J.C. is fine, uh, that she uh, she'll have party support to continue, but but I can't imagine uh, anybody having a more seismic shift in the type of constituency they've been representing than Assemblywoman J.C. She she had been representing. Short Hills and Madison and Harding and Livingston. Yeah. And now she's going to be representing Irvington and she's going to rep be representing uh, no uh, part of Newark and, and the needs of her old district and her new district are, are about as, as wide as I could imagine. And, and I, I just think, I just think that's worth pointing out that, that, uh, there's going to be some adjustments by her. I don't necessarily think it's going to mean much in terms of her voting record. If anything, she'll she'll be. Uh, I don't think she's ever really been squeamish anyway. But if if she were because of Republicans in the Mars section of your district now, now it's fine. But she's she's going to have to make an adjustment. Uh, you know, the other the other thing to look at is 34, uh, uh, and and this is the new district. This is Leroy Jones's commission. We talked about how. Al Barlas getting get, getting his cut for being chair. Uh, this is what this is what Democratic State Chairman Leroy Jones gets, uh, which is a a Senate seat for East Orange. Uh, uh, it would surprise me if it was not Assemblywoman Brittany Timberlake. Uh, she's she is uh, uh, she is a, a loyal member of the Jones team in East Orange, and she's. Uh, She's she's young. She's closer to Joey's age than to to your age or, or, or my age, Micah, uh, and 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 a leader in the legislature. Uh, she is now in a legislative district with. Uh, uh, so there's no senator in that district. Right. Uh, if she moves, there'll be a new assembly seat. She's in a district with Ralph Caputo from Nutley. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I have to, I have to say that, that there is Ralph Caputo's time in the legislature predated Dick Cody by six years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he was, he, he was 26. Yeah. yeah. He was 26 years old, a Republican, and he won an assembly seat in the city of Newark and served there four years. Uh, eventually as, as, as has happened with, with moderate Republicans, over the last 50 years has, has, you know, found a, a realignment of his own ideology. He is, 
He is a Democrat. He's hugely popular with Democrats. He's, mm-hmm. uh, I think he's 80 years old. Uh, uh, I am told that Ralph will be just fine, that, that nobody's going to tell him it's time to retire un- until he's ready. But, but there are some options here for, uh, for more minority legislators. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I would be shocked if one of the legislators isn't from Bloomfield. Uh, and uh, and yep. you, you might see some changes over the years, but these are Democratic seats. Yeah, Can I go on a little bit of an Essex County rant. Essex County rant. I've been a little bit taciturn, but I just I've got a couple of thoughts that I. I don't know. You got to remember who you work for, whether that's a good idea for you. But okay, I'm so very my first thought is that Livingston is terrible, and anyone who is yeah. from Livingston. Oh no! Oh man! Um, <laughs> nice knowing you, Joey. <laughs> So my new, so overall, I think that this this map in Essex County is, is frankly, it's a little bit of a mess. And I, I think that there's kind of two reasons for that. One, you already alluded to with Myla Jacy. Um, she is going from representing one type of district um, that stretches west from her town into another that stretches east. Yeah. Um, and what that functionally does is it put, takes her from a pretty heavily white district into a pretty heavily black district. And I think that's, it's a little suspect. I'm going to be there's, totally So honest. there's no communities of interest for Myla Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. I don't think that they would have done that had she not been a black woman. She, I agree. she is a black woman from a relatively white town, from a relatively white district. And those are the people that she knows and represents. And if she was from the same town and had her same history, but happened to be white instead of black, I do not think they would have put her with downtown Newark. I don't think that's something that they would have been, they would have allowed themselves to consider. And so you have to wonder, well, then why did they consider it for her here? Like, I mean, I'm sure that she will do a perfectly fine job of representing downtown Newark. I'm not questioning that, but it's more like what it, it just, it feels like such an odd shift and it feels like a, it, it, it's a shift that, that, that seems off to me. And then the other thing that seems a little bit off to me is that on the original redraw, they made 28th majority black. Um, and then on both the Republican and Democratic maps, 34 and 27 were both plurality black. Um, that's totally undone by this. And 27 becomes just barely majority minority. It's like 49% white. So white people clearly make up still the dominant group in that district. And you've got, a, you, you're, you're looking at potentially an all white slate where you've got Dick Cody in the Senate and then John McKeon and Tom Giblin in the assembly, at least for a little while until, until someone here or there decides to retire. That also feels off. You had this kind of this move by both parties to say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna increase minority representation. We're gonna make another plurality black district where one wasn't didn't exist before. And now they're undoing that, and they're making a district that, at least for the time being, seems likely to be represented by only only white people, despite having a very narrow minority majority. So again, that just feels off. That 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 feels like something, you know, that they were. I I think it's a relatively nonpartisan perspective to say that like more districts that clearly offer um, different minority ethnic groups the chance to elect their own people is, is in general a good thing. I think that's something that both parties have committed to. And this map weirdly chooses to undo that even after, even after both parties had functionally agreed on it. So that's, that's so, my Essex County take. So, so as long as we're talking about Essex, then I'll, I'll close it with, with, with one of the, uh, the great leaders of all time in Essex County, the late uh, Steve Adubato Sr., uh, Does that mean and we're not going to Hudson, by the way. We, I, we're I, get, yeah, we are. We are. But Essex right, is still okay. the best. And and right. uh, uh, and and I'll tell you what, what what Big Steve would have said, which was uh, uh, that was the deal. Then circumstances have changed, ah, and, and yeah. here is the new deal. And and I think I think that's how it would have worked. So uh, isn't that the same so quote that Darth Vader t- says? I'm sorry. <laughs> isn't that like the Darth Vader quote? Uh, well, uh, Darth Bader had nothing on my friend Steve Adubato, so uh, <laughs> so nothing at all. Uh, let's 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 go into Hudson County, and 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 some some huge you know huge things there. And I'm gonna I'm gonna start with just just probably the smallest part first, uh, mm-hmm. which is that Harrison and Carney, uh, Harrison and East Newark are now in the the 29th district. And one right. of the things that amazed me. Is is the Harrison Democrats, uh, Mayor Mayor Fife and 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 one of the councilmen there, uh, they were the yell- the loudest screamers and yellers about this map, and they were they were saying, you know, we can't have this. Harrison can't be with with Essex. It has to be. We can't we can't cut Harrison out of out of the Hudson County district, and and that 
that to me, and it's just been it's just been sitting with me for a week now that uh, or more, and that's that's sort of the arrogance of some some places in redistricting where one small town of you know 10, 15,000 people thought that they were going to blow up the entire map just because they didn't like where they are. I, I've always called it the Peter Palmer principle. Peter Palmer was a, a, a former mayor of Bernardsville that somehow got in the room in redistricting in 2011 on the Republican side, walked to the map. And, and we've, we've seen this over the years. You know, your eyes go to where you live. That's where you start a map. And and Peter Palmer went to Bernardsville and said, oh, no, we can't separate Bernardsville and put it into a Morris County district. And the guy was the guy was ready to blow up the whole map. And there were literally Republicans in the room saying, who is this guy? Not like, how dare he? But literally, who is this guy? (laughs) We don't know who he is. And he's in the room and he's trying to blow up our map. And that's that's sort of what I read with with Fife. In Harrison, uh, to me, this was simple math, and that's really where I'm getting to with Hudson. And that is, if you took the population of Hudson County and you divided it into three, there was some left over, and you couldn't shove them all in and make these districts the right size. Somebody had to lose. So Harrison is is going to Teresa Ruiz and and Eliana Pintermarine and, and Shanique Spite in the uh, uh, in the 29th. And, and by the way, I, I point out to my friends in Hudson, I've been saying this for, for a couple of weeks now, the last time Harrison was in an Essex district, Hudson got four senators with, with the late Frank Rogers. So it, it worked out okay. But, well, but you just the only thing I'm going to say, and this is, yeah. you would never blow up a map for it. Clearly, we cannot respect uh, county boundaries. It's tough enough to respect municipal boundaries, not suggesting otherwise. You and I have had a lot of discussions throughout the uh, map making process this year about communities of interest and how much importance to place on, a, on communities of interest. And really, when you start boiling it down and start to think about it, counties are really the original communities of interest, right? I mean, right, these, are, right. these are towns that share services, they share regional school districts, they share a lot of things in common. They share a county government. So it's understandable that that's part of their identity. It just so happens that we can't respect it. It just mathematically, it doesn't work. Unless you want to set the clock back to before one man, one vote and go back to county representation in the legislature. Right. Or and you I want would to point- possibly shrink Hudson County. You want to say, I don't like that population growth. Make it go back down. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, I, you know, and I, I remind, and I don't really mean this, this is not a serious suggestion, but I remind uh, any state legislators that are watching uh, us discuss uh, this map right now, they do have the right to go back. The legislature sets the boundaries. And if they feel that they need to redraw county boundaries, they're free to do so. Uh, they just have, have never done that. And, and I look at Harrison, by the way, and I look at it as a community of interest. Harrison has a major uh, Portuguese American population, and they will now be represented in the legislature uh, by a Portuguese American woman, Eliana Pintermarine, who right. who chairs the Assembly uh, Budget Committee. So, so you yep. know, I, I I don't necessarily think they're going to be, you know, I think communities of interest that that fits. But let's let's talk about the meat of what they did in Hudson. Uh, they left the Bayonne, Jersey City model uh, as it has been since 1973, uh, but they shrunk the amount of Jersey City. And they added Kearney. Uh, and so Jersey City has a little bit less influence there. This whole, I mean, and I, you know, I can't stress enough the importance of this debate over whether Jersey City should be split into two or three districts. I, and that was, that's what this map was based on. And, and from everything that I've, I've learned, everything I've heard from people, uh, this idea that, that they might split Jersey City into three, which was the Democrats' original proposal, uh, uh, Jersey City went ballistic on this. Steve Phillips sent a letter saying you cannot do this. And, and I am told that Judge Karchman, uh, uh, in the, you know, because you got to love Jersey in the, in the privacy of whatever rooms he, he was in, Judge Karchman said no. I'm not going to split. I'm not going to. I'm not really interested 
in splitting Jersey City into three different districts when, when you have major forces in Hudson County that are saying, if you do that, we are going to sue you and we're going to take this to federal court. And, and Philip Karchman, uh, he turned out to be a pretty good uh, 11th member, but, but he, he didn't shed that, that w- the reason that he got there in the first place, which is that he's an outstanding judge. And he looked at this, I think, strategically and said, why am I going to put a map out there that is going to go to court and somebody's going to is, is already telling me they're going to they're going to sue to overturn it. So that left that didn't leave that many options here on it, it's how you can draw Hudson County. It's interesting, David, because. Voter wise, I'm not convinced that the three district model can't work or demography wise, I'm not, I'm not convinced that you couldn't do it the way that Jersey City had been split into three districts historically, right, for a long period of time. It is more of the what you just said, the forces in the county. It's more of the internecine political stuff that's going on in the Democratic Party and the way that, that, that mayors have their own turf that would cause problems with the three split, right? You know, so it, that to me had more to do with why there was such a foul on the part of Jersey City, you know, why they why they threw up the foul sign, um, than 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 the idea that they would just be diluted. Numbers wise, I'm not convinced of that. No, I, I think you're right, and I think you know you know number one again, you know, this is my my second public advertisement to legislators who were watching. Uh, uh, you have about seven years to fix this. If if you think that this is a problem, uh, how about maybe maybe looking at it legislatively and and making it clear whether you can or you can't split these towns more than once. And, and, yeah. and that'll be on them. And I'm, I'm confident that now that this map is done, nobody in the legislature has got a real taste for redistricting reform. And, and, and you know, J- Joey, please come, come back at around 2029 and, and sound the alarms again. But, but you know, as we get into to what they did in 32 and 33, I, I just want to also add this because I, I, I have to add the, the history into this. There was Jersey City had two senators until Nick Sacco, the mayor of North Bergen, ran in a primary against Senator Tom Cowan and beat him and took the number of senators from Jersey City uh, from two to one. And there was a period when Joe Doria from Bayonne was in the Senate where Jersey City didn't have any senators at all. So right. so this, I think, is going to hit the reset button. Uh, 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 you know, I, 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 I look at, at what, uh, what, what Assemblyman Raj, Raj Mukherjee uh, did over the weekend. I mean, it, it took him, uh, it took him uh, just, just no time at all. Seconds, yeah. Hours, hours, two <laughs> hours he had this thing wrapped up. The next day he had Governor Phil Murphy on board. I mean, everybody's on board with him, uh, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's you weird just start to referring me. to him in the hall as a senator instead of a yeah, yeah, you should. You should. And I, I sort of look at I sort of look at what I see on Twitter and I know better than to, re, you know, to, to take it too seriously. But there are people who are complaining about the process and and you sort of have to, you have to wonder, you know, what is there about Raj Mukherjee's voting record in eight years in the state assembly uh, that, that, that they don't like, that they're not eager to have him in the Senate? But it's but, funny that you say that, David, because I've seen a lot less blowback on his quick ascension than uh, Rob Menendez's, for example. Yeah. yeah. I've seen a whole lot more blowback. Yeah. On him. yeah. And, and it took him a lot less. It, it took Rob Menendez four days. Right. <laughs> to wrap up that seat. So that's a so, lifetime in New Jersey. Politics. Yeah. So, so I think Jersey city is going to get that seat back. And, and now it is Jersey city, Hoboken, uh, that, that sort of combination, the growing part of Jersey city is the downtown area. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, I, the, the constituency there is not dissimilar to the growth in Hoboken. Uh, there's going to be an assembly, seat to fill in this new new 32nd district and i hope everybody sees how they they went they numbered it you know 31 32 33 so they they sort of got that they got that right there but uh but uh 
as they look to see who's going to fill uh, Mukherjee's assembly seat, I've got to think that Assemblywoman Annette Chaparro from Hoboken, I put her very high on my list of vulnerable incumbents. Uh, she is she is in the assembly because the mayor of Hoboken at the time, Dawn Zimmer, picked her mm -hmm. to be in the assembly. Uh, she brought Latina representation to Hudson County. But ultimately, as we saw by the, the William Sampson rule yeah. in Bayonne, the mayor will the mayor gets to pick that. Uh, and and I wouldn't be surprised as part of this redistricting if if Mayor Ravi Bala goes in a different direction. And and I'll, I'll and I I'm saying this only from from speaking to some people, but nothing formal. I wouldn't be surprised if Mayor Bala in this middle part of his second term as mayor of Hoboken says he'd like that seat too. Sure. And yeah. and uh, it's it's his opportunity to move up. It's his opportunity to not be a a full time mayor and have you know at, at the peak of his earning earning potential to be able to do the part time job instead of the full time job. If that were to happen, that is a big if. There's there's no guarantees, but but that would be the first time in New Jersey history as we talk about a growing AAPI population. This would be a majority. Uh, this would be a legislative district where um, it, a, a, two out of the three, a majority of the legislators in this district would be, uh, would be South Asian. And, and, you know, I sort of think that's, that's one of the things that people had in mind that might happen here. You know, I, I'm, I made one comment to the, uh, to the commission, and that was to not think of um, the opportunities um, for minority groups and Asian groups and any, any minority group as single member districts. Because of the multi-member districts, you actually triple the number of opportunities that we have in each district. So, you know, when we were looking at that Central Jersey plan, there are 18 opportunities for an Asian American to get elected, not just six opportunities. So, um, yeah, I think um, it, it, it will be working the way that it's supposed to work if that's what starts to happen. Okay, so, so let's talk about District 33. Uh, this is one of the two districts where there are two incumbent senators. I mean, and these are mighty, powerful uh, Democratic senators, Brian Stack and Nick Sacco. Brian Stack is the mayor of Union City. Nick Sacco is the mayor of North Bergen. Uh, they are, uh, they are, are, you know, enormous forces in yeah. Hudson County and in New Jersey, and they are in the state district. So, Joey, let me start with you, Hattie. How would you... Number one, do you think we'll actually see a stack Sacco primary? And if we do, uh, how do you handicap that race? Um, as to whether we'll see a primary, I, I, I genuinely don't know. In terms of handicapping it, if it does happen, um, you've kind of got a, a couple of factors in Stack's favor and one big factor in Sacco's favor. The big factor in Sacco's favor is that this district is fundamentally his district right now. Um, right. He kind of takes Union City, but then, and I guess Weehawken, but then, which is pretty small, but everything else is kind of his current, his current turf, West New York, North Bergen, Secaucus. Um, the two assembly members from his district are both his slate, um, Angelica Jimenez and Pedro Mejia. Um, so this is kind of, this is Stack running in his district, not him running in Stack's district. But on the yeah, flip can side- I, can, I, can I add to that for just one yeah, second? Go ahead. One, but it winds up being that, that, that he, Saka represents about 150,000 people in the new district. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm sorry, uh, Sacco does. And Stack represents about 85,000 people in the new district. Yeah, so that's a pretty big disparity. Although Stack did represent some of the territory, like I think West New York. Yeah, West um, New York. Yeah, 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 yeah. In, in, in previous years, and Gutenberg right. in previous years. Um, the, the things in Stack's favor are, for one, he is, he's a younger senator. He's a senator who has a more obvious leadership position in the Senate as Senate Judiciary Chair. That is a, that's a big office. Um, for Hudson Democrats to lose uh, if, if Stack were to lose in a primary. Um, and number two, you know, both are very, very powerful figures within their own hometowns, Union City versus North Bergen. Stack seems to be a little bit more powerful. He seems to be able to just have that little bit more of the get out the vote oomph, um, persuaded or dissuading challengers from even bothering to run against him for mayor, whereas Sacco does face challengers. Um, you know, he, he gets more votes in primaries. 
So if it's really like a hometown battle kind of situation, which is not guaranteed given that there's, you know, 100,000 people in the district who are from neither of their towns. Um, but the two towns combined do make up, I think, a, a slight majority of the district. And if it ends up being kind of a, a battle between those two primarily, and they draw to an e draw even elsewhere, you would think that Stack would have the upper hand. Um, I'll also add one really quick thing. I don't think we said it explicitly before. It's been so implicit in this whole thing. Um, these districts had to change. If Jersey City doesn't get split three ways, you are going to have an incumbent on incumbent battle somewhere. Um, you are going to have to put Hoboken in the 33rd, or you're going to have to put Union City in the 33rd, or you're going to have to move Secaucus around or something. Something was going to have to happen because of population growth. So this is the incumbent battle they chose to have of Sacco versus Stack. Um, there, were other, there were other potential options as well, um, but they couldn't have been avoided entirely unless you split Jersey City. Right. And I was told there was, there was never any real serious discussion about a Sacco Sarlo primary that had been one of the things that people speculated about but but nobody nobody as they were drawing the maps really considered it so it was either split hudson three ways or it was this but micah how do you do you think well, this gets handled or do you think there's there's, um, ways? there's only one way it gets handled without a primary and that's if um you know senator sacco who's 75 decides that he doesn't want to do this um you know senator stack is got 20 years on him he's 55 um, and so that's a big difference uh, when you talk about working hard and working your town like it's never been worked before. Um, so that's the only way it gets resolved, I think. Um, you know, neither one of them has to go away. And, and um, you know, both have their strengths uh, when we come down to a primary like this. Um, I would give the edge in addition to age, I'd give the edge to Stack in terms of uh, his town's a little bit bigger. Uh, it's about 5,000 uh, people bigger. Um, there are um, more registered voters in, in North Bergen, but not by a lot, by about 4,000 vote, uh, 4,000. Um, as you pointed out in your stories, uh, nobody turned out votes for Murphy the way that Senator Stack turned out votes voters for Murphy. Uh, about 3,000 more voters turned out for Murphy in, um, in Union City than in North Bergen. So um, 11,000 versus 8,000. And that in terms of turnout, was a difference between 41% turnout in Union City to 30% in North Bergen. So when you start to look at those kinds of numbers, you really start to see where Senator Stack has a formidable edge. It's also worth yeah. noting that this is going to be, if they both run against each other, this is going to be an epic showdown of two white legislators and mayors who both, um, you know, lead majority Hispanic towns and will be representing a 65% or majority Hispanic towns. I don't know if I said the word Hispanic, um, majority Hispanic towns and will be representing a 65% Hispanic district. Um, so this is kind of, it's an interesting um, legacy of, you know, especially Sacco being an Italian American in, in, a, in a Hispanic town, you know, that, that, that you can see that all over the place in New Jersey, New York, you know, the whole Northeast. Um, it will be interesting that th this will be a battle of two people who demographically are, are not an obvious fit for this district, but have made incredibly tight connections with the Hispanic community and clearly, you know, know what they're doing. They have, and I, you know, I'll tell you, and this is, you know, uh, fr from the journalism side of this, it would be, it'd be a great primary to cover, but, but I, uh, I, I have seen Hudson on the verge of war before and, and they they find peace, you know, be, before they have to. You know, there's there's some extenuating factors here that are that are worth pointing out. One is is Mayor Sacco is Brian Mayor Stack in Union City is up this May, and and you know doesn't have an opponent. And Mayor Sacco is up in May of 23, mm. and this would put two races, two big races that would potentially define his legacy within three weeks of each other. Uh, you know, there is a difference between the two and they are, they are both giants and there should be, you know, whether, whether you like them or you don't like Absolutely. them, what they have accomplished is, is substantial and, and their commitment to their constituencies is, is, is clear. And it's, you know, I think it's impressive. Uh, but I, you know, I look, I look at really a lot of the math here, uh, Brian Stack is the GOTV king. And, 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 you know, one of the numbers I looked at 2021, they both ran 
for state Senate and Democratic primaries. They were both unopposed. Stack got 8,150 votes in Union City and Nick Sacco got 4,400. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. So, and, and, you know, another difference here between the two of them and, and you know, even, even the, the Sacco people will, will concede this is, is Brian Stack can get north of 90% of the vote in Union City. Uh, Sacco is enormously popular, but there's still a third of the people in North Bergen that will not vote for him. And that potentially puts a lot of other things at stake. What, what, what Mayor Sacco doesn't want is for Brian Stack to suddenly become engaged in North Bergen local politics. Uh, uh, you know, Anthony Venere occupies the county commissioner seat for North Bergen. They're up in 2023. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Commissioner Venere doesn't want a, a progressive Hispanic primary opponent there. I could see that all, that all playing in. Uh, you know, this would be, this would be a, a, a race, you know, you know, probably one of the, the best primaries, you know, of my lifetime. Yep. Uh, I just don't think we're going to get it. I, and by the way, it, it should be very clear. Uh, you know, there's differences of the two, two sides in Hudson County, but, but there's no evidence that Sack, Stack and Sacco personally don't have respect for each other. And, and I think that will play into it. And I think they will, you know, there's a lot at stake. There's a county executive coming up. There's a county chairman's race coming up. There's there's assembly seats. There's a lot of moving pieces to this. And, you know, and I'll say also, as I, I talk about endangered Democratic incumbents and Republican incumbents uh, in their in, in races for their own nomination to extend their, their careers in Trenton, uh, I've got to add Angelica Jimenez and Pedro Mejia into this uh, because they could be they could be the unintended casualties of a primary as many many Hudson County politicians were over the years uh, they were they were sort of just the the flotsam and jetsam of what was happening at the top of the ticket uh, uh, if if Brian Stack and Nick Sacker were to face off and Stack were then to go recruit his own running mates it'd be possible that the two of them would go it's also possible that part of the a deal with Sacco might include an assembly member from North Bergen. And that could be at the expense of, uh, of, of uh, one, you know, one or two of these, uh, the two incumbents, uh, Jimenez and, and Mejia. Uh, you know, they are, they are the ones that are, that are, will, will sleep best if, if there is peace between Sacco and Stack. Although, you know, as I just said, uh, one of them could be a casualty of a deal and, and see their career end. So, so I think this is just, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a great district to watch, uh, but it's, you, you haven't, you haven't seen two people of this magnitude faced off before. And, you know, with respect to Senator Gill and Montclair, uh, you know, she, you know, you know, she's not at the same level as Dick Cody, these two guys, uh, Nicholas Sacco and Brian Stack, they are, uh, they, they are, they are, they're historic figures in Hudson County politics. And, and they're going to have to figure out a way to, uh, to get along. And, and there's, there's no way out of it. There's, there's just no way out of it. Uh, let's just go through. Cause we're, you know, we're, uh, uh, you know, nobody's ever going to hire the three of us to put on a, a show because we cannot hit our time mark at all ever. Uh, you know, and, and, and I hope people have stuck with this. Uh, we don't even say what our time mark is. That's how I'm back. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that's it's the beauty, beauty of, of streaming is, is that, uh, uh, you know, we're, we don't have to uh, uh, we don't have to stop on time for Barney and friends or something to to, to be shown. But uh, but 30, you know, 36, Paul Sarlo, who, you know, I say all the time, started his career by flipping a Republican assembly seat. Uh, uh, he's, he's in good shape. Clinton Calabrese uh, is in good shape. Gary Sharon, Passaic, this district, uh, this district is fine. 37 is, is fine. Uh, Holly Shapizzi 
in the 39th, uh, picks up more of Bergen, uh, loses to the West, some Republican towns of Passaic County. Uh, she and Bob Off and Deanne DeFuccio, they're, they're in good shape in, in 2023. Uh, you know, this again, this is, this is in that category of watch this district later in the decade. Uh, uh, you know, 35 obviously is, is no problem. And then we get to 38 and, and this district really didn't change at all. There were some, some nips and tucks, right. uh, but, but this, this again is a district that is, that is, is generously to Republicans, democratic leaning, but as I see it, not impossible for Republicans. It's and, not. But, and the but only, but the only route, the only route at all to a Republican majority in the Senate is to is to flip 14 and 38. Right. And and if this is the kind of year that might be worst case scenario for uh, uh, for for Democrats, you know, it, it could put Joe Lagana and Lisa Swain and, and Chris Tully. And by the way, Chris Tully you know, if you remember under the Republican map was put into 39. Now, now he's back and, 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 and he's resting better at night, but, but this district is, you know, this district was, wasn't close in 21, but it was closer on election night uh, than, than some people may have expected against, against Republicans who spent nothing. Uh, right. Paramus is the swing town in that district. It's Joe Lagana's hometown. But Republicans, as of as of January, control it. And and, you know, I look at the the bellwether of the Maywood special election last uh, last week and, and Republicans flip that seat. This is I mean, are, are you guys in agreement with me? This is this is this is going to be a Democratic seat until it's not. And if this one goes Republican, then you might see Republicans controlling the legislature. Well, you put it in an interesting way because because um, it does get three, um, three and a half, three and a fraction of the county pro, but um, it gets Little Ferry, Munachi, and South Hackensack, and of course Teterboro. And those three um, are you know small Democratic pluralities typical typically come out of them for for the legislative vote. Um, but you raise a really good point. If it becomes a wave election, does that matter? Or do they get swept up like other towns get swept up? So, yeah. um, you know, in a normal year, yes, I think that this gives them a scooch more Democratic votes, a couple hundred more Democratic votes. But in a wave year, it goes with the rest of the county. So I, I looked it up and Joe Lagana actually won by a slightly lower, s- smaller margin than Andrews Wicker won um, in 2021. It's not b- because it d- didn't get any in any co- much coverage, including from us at the Globe, you know, we missed it a little bit in the lead up to 2021. It, you know, people weren't really looking at it to, to have a close margin. It did kind of, it was less than six points. Um, it is definitely the kind of district where, you know, these scooches help Democrats, um, but they're not, they don't, they don't take it out of play um, yeah. as much as it was in play to begin with. Also, there, I was, I was looking at the data and there's sort of an interesting magic trick in Bergen County where all four Bergen County based districts. So 36, 37, 38, 39, all four of them actually get a little bit more democratic, yes. um, which feels impossible, yeah. but it's because Essex and Hudson um, and just urban areas in general grew the fastest from 2020 to 2020. So everything had to shrink towards, so point. like, you know, you give Crestkill to 39, mm-hmm. that boosts it a little bit, but it also conversely makes the 37th a little bit more democratic because the way that it all balances out. So, um, so this is a map that doesn't deliver any knockout punches for any party, but just based on sheer population math helps Democrats a bit. Yeah, and one of the things I, I look at with 30, you know, 38 too, and this is, this is, this is an issue for all, you know, all prognosticators like us is, is we look at final numbers and, you know, and six years and 10 years and 40 years from now, people are going to go look at the numbers, but, but the big asterisk here is that, uh, is that, Joe Lagana didn't run a campaign that he would have run had he thought uh, that 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 seat was in jeopardy. Uh, and, and so you what you saw was, I think, more of a base vote as opposed to, you know, if Joe Lagana had been engaged and 
and had not ended the campaign with a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Uh, but he's got a couple hundred thousand dollars to start this cycle now, uh, just in case. I want to throw I'll throw one thing out, you know, with with 38 before we wrap up. And, and that is, uh, you know, we talk about where people might might have opportunities for the legislature because of this historically long runway between the the approval of the map and the uh, and, and, and filing day in, in 20 uh, in, in April of 2023 is what candidates could emerge. Uh, I I look at a guy like Nick De Gregorio, uh, Marine Corps veteran, served in combat, running against Josh Gottheimer. Uh, if he doesn't win the primary, uh, uh, or if he runs a competitive race against Josh Gottheimer, uh, the human fundraising machine and his fifteen million dollars, which will which will be twenty by the time we're we're done with this. Uh, a guy like Nick De Gregorio out of Fairfield, a fair, fair lawn. Yeah. Uh, I think he could emerge as a strong state Senate candidate in the district. You're going to make, you're going to make people very upset with you for, for, for even discussing, for discussing that because yeah. you're right. I mean, there are, what did we look at when, when you did the, the run of the, uh, how many congressional candidates are, 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 uh, it's like two to one or three to one in Republican candidates right, right now coming out than, than Democrats. And yeah, if there is a future for that, they they are running off of their bench and they're they're building out their bench and there's enthusiasm on their side. And if they choose to run after this year, then next year is the next logical one in any number of races for them to consider running in. So, so, so Nick yeah. Gregor, De Gregorio's first choice is to be a congressman, but but there is there is a second act for him yeah. if people are impressed with him this year. And, and clearly, and, the, the Republican attitude right now is to run everywhere. And so, yes. um, you know, so I think you could see more legislative interest next year. And I, you know, I look at I look at somebody like like John Henry Eisman, who's running in the seventh, who had a uh, uh, a a unexpectedly strong third place showing. I feel like I'm in a West Wing episode where where where, where Jed Bartley came in third and they were all cheering. But <laughs> but for for Eisman in Hunterdon County to do as well as he did among county committee. I mean, I, I'd look at him and I'd say, you know, I'd say, and I, and I may actually say this to him, which is, which is, are, are you going to move to Somerset or Hunterdon County and run in the 16th next year? Uh, because, because he's shown that there's, there's something there, there with him. Uh, one other thing I wanted to just talk about before we wrap this up is, is some of the differences. Uh, you know, this is, this is, this is my fifth, round of, of, of redistricting that I've been involved in either either in one of the rooms or or as a journalist Mikey you've you've seen a, a lot Joey you have read up on the history uh, one major difference that I see and it would be it would be improper for us to to, to not acknowledge it is is the rise in the influence of regular people, and, and interest groups in this redistricting process. It had never, ever been like this before. You know, we had, you had, you had high school students drawing maps from what yeah. Judge Karchman said, some really, really good maps, college students. You had, you had groups of people uh, that were participating in this, this process. You know, I, I think, I think the first time around, it's, it's it's a little bit of a hard adjustment. You have to you have to balance what you'd really like to see with with maybe something a little bit closer to earth of what the actual voters on this commission will take. But but now everybody can go on Dave's redistricting or other apps and draw their own maps. And I think that is uh, I think that is a historic that is a significant part of redistricting in in 2021 and 2022 that we uh, uh, we're only going to, I think we're only going to see more of it rather than less. Yeah. Although it goes fact, back to, Oh, go ahead. Mike. No, no, go ahead, Joey. No, no. It, well, it just goes back to sort of my, my point at the beginning about flawless process, flawed result, where you sort of had this process that was really, really inclusive. A lot of, of a lot of these groups, but then in a lot of cases you had the commission kind of not ignoring whatever they said anyways, yeah. like, um, well, but judge Karchman yeah. was not ignoring it. 
Oh no, well, so I, I, I don't mean to say completely ignoring. I just mean like the end map. So like, for example, there was a pretty, there was a pretty um, calibrated opposition to moving uh, Hillside into an Essex-based district, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you had a number of people coming out to the, the Zoom commission hearing saying, don't do this, which you can argue for the utility of listening to that because, you know, it's just, that's more about which towns organize themselves better than about what the actual, you know, what people actually want. But, you know, you had that, okay, so you had five people or whatever say that, and then, you know, Hillside got moved anyway. Or you have, you know, Fair Districts, New Jersey, and all, all these coalition groups saying, you need to draw more than 17 majority minority districts. And the commission not only didn't draw anymore, but they actually made one a lot weaker, which is the 27th. So, so you kind of have like, okay, like, it actually is really great how, how open and particip participatory this process is. But I think for people to sort of trust it as an open and participatory process, you might need to have a little bit, the, the final map reflect that participation a little bit more. I'm not entirely positive this does. Yeah. So let me, Michael, go ahead. And then I want to ask two more. No, I, I think at the end of the day, the parties um, are going to represent, uh, you know, when push comes to shove, Republicans did want more competition. Uh, but when push comes to shove, everybody wanted to protect their incumbents. And so, um, you know, this butts up against um, some of those public criteria that people were looking at. And um, so, you know, it's all got to go into the wash. And we know which ones the parties were looking for. And we know that protecting incumbents was important to both parties, their own incumbents. And we know that with a brokered map, that that was going to be reflected. That was going to be, I think, Joey, to your point, you could very well have seen more um, of that absorbed into a map if Karchman had um, wound up being the deciding vote. But since he didn't have to be, um, you were going to get more of the party process. You were going to get more of their priorities reflected. That is true. A, a bipartisan process empowers both parties yeah, in a way sorry. that a singular partisan process mm -hmm. would empower Karchman yep. to kind of limit the effect of, of the partisanship. Yep. So let me ask two quick closing questions. Uh, uh, you know, and again, I repeat with the hope that there's still people watching us. Uh, uh, but number one, this was the first time in New Jersey history where where the tiebreaker on uh, on on both, but or ever congressional or legislative was a former judge and right. not an academic. Uh, you know, it seemed to work well on legislative. I don't think there's anybody who thought it worked well on congressional. Uh, 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 Micah, you know, for for your profession, are we are we <laughs> going to see future? Chief justices look at uh, look at judges again, or, or do you think the the benching of academics is a temporary situation? Um, well, I do think that Judge Karchman has redefined the role. So no matter who does it, whether it's a judge or whether it's an academic or whether it's somebody else, I think you are now going to see at least a serious run at trying to broker the compromise and trying to say you're not going to like the outcome, and from what I understand, he made it very clear, you do not want me to start slicing and dicing this map. You want to hammer this out yourselves. And mm -hmm. he made them believe that. And so I think no matter what happens, no matter who does it, you're gonna see much more of that role, the role of the, um, of the broker, rather than the role of the um, um, decider, I think, at least, at least an attempt at that. Yeah. And, and let, me, let me close with this question, let's, let's 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 have a vote here, and let's let's see where we all are. Uh, uh, will, despite calls for the for reforming the <laughs> redistricting process, uh, uh, will parties ever give up control of drawing congressional and legislative maps? No, no, especially not after this process, because now they've got a clear victory to point to. Yeah, they can I, say, look, we did this great. You don't have, we don't have to lose power over this. It worked perfectly. So, yeah, and, yeah. and I agree with both of you. I think we, we are, we are unanimous here. This is, uh, there is, uh, there is no way the political parties will ever give up control of this uh, to a, a citizen commission the way other states have. And uh, uh, unless some court orders them to do so. Uh, One thing I'll I, add though, that we didn't, we didn't discuss at all on this is that there are ongoing lawsuits about whether the county line um, mm -hmm. is constitutional. So we talked about every every district in this map as Bergen Republicans decide this, 
Hudson Democrats don't want it's this. Good point. It's a good point. By the end of this decade, that could become much less, irre- much less relevant and voters can start to sort of have more of individualized preferences for different politicians yeah. that escape the county lines. So, yeah. so we'll see if, if that happens during this decade, which I don't think there's a zero percentage of that happening. Um, you could see a very different type of politics and cohort of legislators in office by the end. And I'm going to wait and see whether Chief Justice Rabner, uh, after after an appropriate waiting time, uh, goes to legislators and says, you know, I don't I don't like the position the judiciary was put in here uh, by by picking picking a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate for congressional or appointing a tiebreaker. It 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 you know, I think it. it I, I would not be surprised if the Chief Justice uh, pushes for some reforms from his end of you've got to figure out something different that that this is not the court's role and it 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 potentially compromises the independence of the judiciary. He he clearly very very clearly felt constrained on the congressional side. Um, you know, the, the, you you would very often hear um, you know remember um, you know he didn't have a choice here. He you know he had. He had the two candidates. He couldn't go outside of those two candidates uh, from each party, and it was a completely different process than what he had um, on the um, on the uh, on the state side. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you again. This is I. These are fun for me, and this is you know this is for the people that are, are watching. This you know this these are the these are the conversations the three of us have all the time, uh, long long uh, and detailed and. And it's a lot of fun, and 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 we love this time. And I am, uh, I'm really sorry that I'm going to be 70 years old the next time uh, we redraw maps because you know this is this is just just my favorite time, and I and I wish it came more frequently than every 10 years. But I'm still not uh, even going to be as old as the youngest legislator. No, you won't. But <laughs> but we'll see. You might be at the time. But we'll. And thanks we'll for tuning it. in, everybody, because the yeah, thank fact you. that you actually want to want to listen to what we have to say is great. So. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a good night and and we'll we'll talk again soon.